Good day, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kayla Altman, and I am a Communities Coordinator at ASUG, and I am pleased to welcome you to today's webcast, From Vision to Value, Finding the Way Forward, Episode 6 of 8 of our Internet of Things webcast series. I do have a few announcements and some housekeeping notes to please keep in mind. The first is a reminder to look for your personalized webcast listing each Monday. There you will find uh, information on webcasts such as the Internet of Things and other things that you might find of interest. Today's webcast will be recorded, and the recording will be posted to the discussions area on ASUG.com later on this afternoon. We will also email that out directly to you. A reminder for those of you who are looking to give your feedback directly to SAP that the second cycle of the SAP Customer Engagement Initiative is currently accepting registrations. Register by June 26th to participate. Coming up soon is a number of events hosted by ASUG in partnership with SAP. The first is the Business Objects and Analytics Conference, which is scheduled to take place August 31st to September 2nd in Austin, Texas. In addition, we will also be co-locating that event with a three-day hands-on analytics training course for business users. For more information, please visit the uh, website on your screen. Uh, I'd now like to turn us over to uh, Paul Kirchina, who will speak a little bit more about the Internet of Things webcast series and introduce our speakers for today. Paul? Thank you, Kayla, and, and welcome everyone to our call. As, as Kayla mentioned, this is uh, episode number six of our eight-part series. Um, we have webcast uh, one week from now on June 30th at 12 p.m. I want to highlight with uh, uh, two, actually, episodes in, in the same one hour, one with Jasper and one with Zebra. So that should also be a very informative webcast, as well as our closing webcast in this initial series is on July the 9th. Um, so uh, to wrap things up, and we're working as, as a community to plan more content um, in the interest of educating our ASUG member base in terms of this exciting new area of Internet of Things. I'm actually coming to you today um, from the SAP manufacturing event that kicks off later this afternoon where um, there are quite a few IoT topics, and we'll be sure to uh, get a briefing out to you later on on key happenings from that event. So without further ado, um, I want to introduce our next speakers um, from Accenture. Um, Anil uh, Parkesh, I hope I pronounced it correctly, Neil, and Walid Nagam, um, to really share with you from their perspective, um, from really vision to value, um, what Internet of Things um, is all about. Thank you, Paul. Um, I hope you can all hear me okay. Uh, this is Anil Parekh from Accenture, and thank you for inviting us to speak about how we get from vision to value when we're talking about the Internet of Things. In this presentation, we'll, we'll take about 45 minutes or so, and maybe a few minutes less than that, to walk through our perspectives, what we've seen in the industry play out, and, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, hope, hopefully have some discussion towards the end. Uh, on the call, um, just uh, confidentiality notice and disclaimer, of course, uh, uh, please feel free to read that. Um, on, on the call today from Accenture, um, uh, myself, Anil Parekh, I'm, I'm in the Resources Operating Group, which is our uh, industry focus group around utilities, energy, mining, chemicals, and other asset-heavy industries. And I lead our co-innovation with Accenture and SAP together in some of the industries that we want to work in, in particular most recently around the ITOT integration that we're doing in the utility sector. With me is uh, Walid again, and Walid, if I hand over to you to introduce yourself. Uh, thanks, Neil. Uh, coming hailing from uh, Washington, D.C., uh, um, I lead our uh, IoT R&D activities. Uh, it's actually a global organization. We have uh, facilities in Silicon Valley and um, in Beijing and in Europe. I'm so uh, glad to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you. Thank you, Walid. And our colleague Wayne Kerwood, unfortunately, had a client situation today, uh, and he apologizes for not being here, but he would have been very helpful in telling us about the work we've been doing in the smart grid space in this area as well. But I'll hopefully um, be a good substitute on some of the points he wanted to make. Okay, so without further ado, um, 
just getting into the content. So today we want to talk about really four parts in our discussion. One is, uh, Waleed will lead through what is the big idea? You know, why are, we, why are we, what is our perspective and what is the industry saying about IIoT or IoT? Um, where is the value? Uh, I think we've heard a lot about that discussion in, in the press uh, about number of connected items, number, you know, the opportunity in front of a number of industries, whether they're consumer industries or asset heavy industries. But then we want to talk about a few examples of what we've been experiencing with our clients in, in terms of the connected operations aspects of, of IoT. And then finally, we'll, lead, uh, we'll, we'll uh, round out and give us some perspectives on, on what really needs to happen to, to make money out of this uh, or five ways to win. So, Walid, over to you. Uh, thanks, Neil. So let's just uh, get right in. You know, one, one, one thing I wanted to do today is leave, leave behind some of the reports that we did uh, in the last couple of years, from, actually from 2013 to 2015. I think those would be helpful uh, for you to uh, think through uh, the numbers um, from, from research work. I think this was a report we did in 20, I think it was in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, um, or, or 2014. It, it asked a sort of a macro level question around the impact of IoT on economies. It's not just how um, the effects will happen on foreign, but how can countries themselves get started. The report determined that, uh, you know, I think the, it was 20 countries that we surveyed, and the GDP, the uh, gross domestic product benefit, uh, was um, about $10.6 trillion by 2013 for those uh, 20 nations. Uh, so that's a big number um, for a pretty, uh, pretty big idea. Uh, what was interesting uh, about the report is if, if those economies were to increase their investments in this area uh, by uh, 50% and improve the underlying enabling conditions, uh, GDP would rise by 1 uh, to 1.5%. 1. Uh, so I mean, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a big, uh, it's a big trend. I think we all know it's a big trend. Uh, but this report, I think, speaks uh, to the um, you know, to the impact on on countries uh, and how important it is for firms to to really think about the value that these uh, technologies are going to bring. So I'll let you sort of absorb the numbers here uh, and the stats at your leisure. Um, you know, I think it's either the same report or a different one. I think we'll give you a list of uh, of all these research reports. Uh, clearly, uh, IoT is a game changer for world economies and their firms. Uh, it's going to accelerate productivity. Uh, it's going to overcome infrastructure gaps. It's going to drive innovation. And this is some of the areas that uh, that we felt were important, um, you know, outcomes, if you will. Uh, in manufacturing, which we'll talk to uh, in the middle part of this presentation, and we hear a lot about that especially in production asset-intensive uh, firms, connected sensors and networks uh, are already allowing for the monitoring of logistics movements, uh, machines such as mining equipment and entire utility plants are, help, you know, are instrumented uh, data being gathered from you know, various pieces of equipment to reduce costs, you know, ensure continuous operations as opposed to uh, you know, having to go from the break-fix scenario more to the predictive maintenance scenario to get ahead of the problem. Ensure uh, uh, you know the, the manufacturing run continues. Uh, in agriculture, you know network deploys across farmlands are improving the use of natural resources and contributing to better harvest. So I think when you look at outcomes, it's not you know, certainly greater productivity gains, but also improved quality of life and uh, faster innovation cycles. Um, when when we think about IoT, we we do you know Accenture does look at the world in terms of uh, consumer applications as well as industrial applications, and so we've, you know, we've uh, tried to use the tagline uh, "industrial Internet of Things" to make that distinction. But certainly, the connected lifestyle area, uh, digital health, uh, are important contributors to uh, to growth and productivity. I think one of the points here, just I'd like to make before I move on, is we believe, contrary to, to conventional wisdom, maybe that the increased automation. Uh, whether it's through, through robotics, uh, potentially reduced, you know, reduced workforces in factories, this this next generation of digital technology will actually benefit the workforce. We'll see uh, 
you know, we'll see new roles emerging in the areas of data science, remote operating centers where you may have the dull, dirty, and dangerous tasks being performed by robots, for example, but individuals will have to remain to interpret the streams of data that are coming out from sensors and be able to have that context around the industry and uh, the customer experience to be able to take action. So we believe certainly there'll be a, a net benefit over a certain period of time on the workforce. One of the interesting, uh, you know, one of the interesting areas. This is another report, which you know, hopefully we'll make sure you get the links up. Uh, we talk a lot about IT helping improve productivity, reducing operating costs. We're, we're, we're going to dig into some examples later on. We talk about enhancing worker safety through wearables and uh, you know sensors. For example, in a you know in a refinery, you can detect toxic gases and alert the individual to get out of harm's way, or maybe a man down type of scenario. Uh, sensors will be very helpful to, uh, in that in that area, but much of the GDP growth will come from increasing um, uh, return on capital from existing assets. Uh, but there are also a significant opportunity for uh, new services, new products uh, being introduced into the marketplace. And so again, predictive maintenance is you will hear that a lot, uh, whether it's for aircrafts or wind farms. Right, it's a very popular discussion. I think that's the low hanging fruit. You know, how do we get to fewer stoppages wherever? Right? How do we you know, how do we make more things? How do we make more widgets? Uh, and asset monitoring is an important part of that, that that answer. However, the longer term economic and employment benefits will require companies to establish entirely new product and services uh, portfolios that disrupt their own markets and generate fresh revenue streams. So I think uh, this slide really speaks to a vision that we have. It's not that familiar, you know, in um, in, in the medical industry around outcomes. Right? Um, right? How do you you know how do you compete on outcomes versus selling just products? Let me just give you an example of what an outcome is. Uh, this is an example of shit. We kind of dug it up, if you will. Imagine if you go to a comedy show and instead of paying for just a ticket to see the show, you pay for the number of laughs. Right? So you pay for yeah, each time you laugh, you, you actually you pay for that, right? So that's an experience, a positive experience that you get. So that, you know, there's a theater in Barcelona doing this. Uh, they actually have used facial recognition software and they count how many laughs that you've, you know, you've given out, and then they charge you uh, based upon that. I think the name of the company is uh, Teatro Nero, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. And so that's the big idea behind buying of an outcome that you only, you know, you, you pay what you've, you know, what you've, what you've, um, for the result that you expect. Medicine is another example where you know, go to a doctor, prescribe you a medication. It's not just a pill. The outcome is that the patient will take the medicine, um, and then the patient doesn't, you know, doesn't uh, doesn't skip out. And so there's, you know, there's certainly uh, the idea of inserting sensors into pills, uh, and the sensor is part of a system of systems that determines when the patients take their medicine. There's easier ways to do that, of course, um, you know, to detect when a, a patient has actually taken their medicine from, say, a cabinet, for, for example. But again, again, the idea of an outcome uh, you know, being the patient actually taking the medicine. And so this is a, an important part of our vision for the industrial internet of things. Right? The business leaders want to think in terms of results, uh, in terms of the why behind the buy. Uh, how do you translate that into uh, more mainstream adoption? Right? Because it's not, it's not easy to determine whether a result has been achieved or not. And so you think about this type of technology, sensors, analytics, uh, that wasn't present in the past, you can then use these technologies to know if the outcome is met or not and to be able to measure that outcome. So IoT to us is, and the various technologies are, allows companies to recognize that they can, in fact, deliver outcomes and compete on outcomes. Not everybody will compete on outcomes, but um, certain industries like agriculture, like healthcare, um, in, even in the resources sector, um, they'll be able to essentially have a Fitbit for everything you're doing and to be able to drive that kind of outcome. So here's an example, some examples of relationships between uh, DuPont and Deer uh, and others in the agriculture sector, and then on the right-hand side uh, in terms of relationships between certain vendors uh, and how we want to be able to deliver outcomes. So I encourage you to think about you know, what it means to deliver an outcome for your business and in the long term, and how do you can use IoT to get there? And how can you compete on outcomes?
So all this is goodness, right? They, there's certainly a, some, some would say an excess amount of technology out there. Uh, it's sort of combinatorial in a way, right? Sensors, software, uh, open stack hardware, right? IT ain't what it used to be. We do see a gap between the ideas that are out there and the technologies that are out there and actually action. And so here's another separate report that we produced in collaboration with the Economist Intelligence Unit, and it reflects the views of C-suite leaders across the world on IoT. Um, you know, and I think the you know not not everybody has really gotten a handle on right on strategy. Right, a mere seven percent have developed a comprehensive strategy and committed investment. So when we think about the purpose of this presentation, right, the idea of going from vision to value. Uh, do we believe that strategy is a really important part of that first phase of trying to get through that fuzzy phase of innovation or ideation and thinking, you know, what's important for me? Um, you know, how do I prioritize the types of uh, applications that I'm going to deliver, whether it's through my workforce, my assets, uh, for asset performance, for example? But that, that part of road mapping, if it's business value realization, is really important to get through before you can spend more money on standing up cloud services and whatnot to, to ingest sensor data. I try to figure out what the value proposition is. So I, I see the game changer of certainly, you know, at least our study shows that a significant number of ASEAN leaders um, have not made as much inroads as they'd like, constrained by certainly capital, uh, the poor information, and lack of a coherent strategy. So we gave a couple of examples on uh, you know, the use of sensors and analytics to drive outcomes, right? predictive maintenance, um, healthcare, for example. Uh, but is there, a you know, is there a good definition of IoT? You know, there's certainly uh, you know, the, the technical definition, which suggests that it's a network of physical objects and systems that are connected to one another. The universe of the billions of billions of IT-enabled objects out there. So that's sort of the technical definition. Um, I think that's the left-hand side of, of, of the diagram here. Right? It's connectivity. Uh, it's the compute, whether it's on-premise or in cloud. Uh, it's the communications, right, to be able to get to those sensors. And so I think that the technical definition is pretty, you know, getting to be uh, pretty straightforward to comprehend what IoT is. When I at least present, and I think we're, what we're going through in the deck today is really you have to start with the business value proposition first. Right? The idea of IoT helping improve productivity, reduce operating costs, enhancing worker safety, those areas, right? Reimagining the business model right? and even thinking in terms of longer term benefits around outcomes. I think when you think in those terms, uh, you, can, you can then start to have a discussion around the enabling technologies. Like, well, how do I get there? And so it, it's pretty, it's obvious. Right, you want to start with the why before how, but a lot of times we get you know, too excited about some of these technologies and spend a lot of time thinking about sensors and miniaturization, you know, machine learning and you know the the IoT stack. And we forget that uh, there's a reason why we want to make some of these investments. And so I think I encourage you to look at um, the technical definition, but also look at the operational efficiencies and top line growth uh, first before diving into the IoT stack. So here's, you know, here's, here's that, you know, what's called a value tree, I suppose, um, from left to right, so it's top to bottom. Again, re-emphasizing that you know, we uh, see and acknowledge the value proposition around operational efficiencies. Right? Those are the bottom in the yellow. Uh, but we, we, we strongly encourage a, a healthy conversation around incremental revenue and unconventional revenue growth. And so the, the idea that IoT is about thinking unconventionally in terms of where you want to go with your business. I, I wrote a paper about this a couple of years ago. It was called Driving Unconventional Growth Through the Industrial Internet of Things. It really solidified our point of view that um, where our clients need to go is you know, not simply uh, looking at the low-hanging fruit, but you know, making a conscious effort uh, to boost revenues by increasing production, creating new business models, Right, transforming the workforce. Right, so that's 
Uh, that's the second part of the conversation. Certainly, I think in, the, in the short run, it's important to pick up the low-hanging fruit. It's the, the top two uh, leaves of the tree, if you will, uh, are an important part of the conversation. Again, we're, we're going to go through some examples later on, so I'll, I'll just move ahead. Yeah, often, uh, you know, I think what where we or Accenture helps our clients a lot is seeing the forest uh, from the trees, seeing the trees from the forest, right? Trying to make sense of the world, the technologies that are impacting our different industries uh, and sub industries, whether it's automotive, it's transportation. When we, you know, when we we're trying to, you know, how do we simplify this to our clients? And how do we have a conversation on value, right? So we, I think the vision is there. We have a good idea about the enabling technology. There's a lot of startup activity, a lot of emerging technology. This was a, you know, this was a simple framework that we felt pretty helpful, right? Uh, to have a conversation around where, you know, where is the impact for you in industry X, right? Uh, so one of these verticals should make sense to you in terms of your business. Right? Whether you're an asset owner or operator, right? or you're an OEM, one of these verticals makes sense. So the idea here is you know, how do you establish a disciplined process to identify, prioritize, and develop IoT use cases, certainly with input from your partners. Right? So connected transport is the idea of you know, how do you maximize vehicle interaction with people, infrastructure, surrounding environments, and payloads. So if you're an asset, you know, if you own vehicles, this is relevant to you. If you manufacture vehicles, this is also relevant to you to make an attractive product. How do you make a connected car? You know, one that has the ability to um, collect the right amount of data on board, communicate that data back to a remote operating center, to do the diagnosis and, and make recommendations. Okay. A connected spaces is about, you know, we all have facilities that we either own, le lease or rent. We have financial obligations around energy consumption. Uh, we want to reduce waste. We want to make the, we want to make the area a much more uh, safe environment for our employees. And so connected spaces is, is all about that. It also includes the idea of connected home. Again, relevant for utilities as they want to get closer to the end customer and provide them with value-added services. And also relevant for OEMs like Nest, which is owned by Google, right? and any other company that produces connected devices at home. And so you know, we, thought, we thought it would be helpful to dig deeper into one of these verticals and talk about value around connected operations. And so we've, you know, we'll do that in a couple of, in a couple of minutes here. We'll dig deeper into the connected operations vertical uh, through use cases in, in the resources sector. So, you know, well, I just wanted to, I think I wanted to end this particular section around vision. Uh, I make sure that, you know, you think unconventionally about customer value, right, your customer value. Uh, here's, you know, here's an example of some vendors that are thinking unconventionally. Right, they're moving from standalone disconnected products and they're moving to outcome-based services. Right? And the idea here is they're not selling the product itself, but they're able to wrap around it digital services, information-based services. Right? So Michelin Group is one of those examples that comes up a lot uh, where you know, they've, they've been featured in one of the reports. Uh, they have a new uh, unit. Uh, it was launched around the idea. It's called Epic Fuel. And the idea is to, it, it is to help truck fleet managers reduce fuel consumption. There's other metrics in there around they could save up to a couple of liters of fuel per 100 kilometers driven. And the service included Michelin outfitting its trucks with sensors or the trucks with sensors attached uh, to the vehicle's engine and tires. So the sensors collect data on fuel consumption, tire pressure, temperature, speed, and then this data is transmitted to a cloud service where Michelin experts analyze it and make recommendations. Right, so this is a company that right, is able to not just sell a tire, but also sell diagnostic services using the power of IoT. Right, 
and then the clients also have the option of paying for the tire on a per kilometer basis. So, you know, again, you don't have to go all the way to the right-hand side to add company services, and, but there's a spectrum here in terms of you know, how do you make an attractive product. Now, if, if you're not a product maker, but you actually own these products, you got to ask the question to the manufacturer, right? You know, do you have sensors that I can pull, uh, that, that, that I can pull and, um, and do diagnostics on it, right? What, what is your predictive maintenance and warranty contracts look like, right? Why should I be stuck with a brake fix model? You need to offer me more services right, around operations, around connected operations. And so it's a two-way street. Well, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Anil to take us through that one of those towers, those value use cases towers. Over to you. I'm hoping people can hear me. Uh, okay, I'm just going to start off on the connected operation story. Uh, I know some people had issues at the beginning of the call uh, not being able to hear. Um, so thanks very much, Ali. So the, the the first thing, just to step back and thanks, uh, is to take a take a glance at what's going on in terms of connected operations. Um, connected operations, you know, is very much around the industrial side of the value chain, if you like, as a customer side. We're looking at asset heavy industries, and so just to remind ourselves on the points Ali raised, there is a significant um, market, you know, that is enabled by connecting the physical to the digital world through through the industrial internet. Um, you know, estimated to have an impact of over 12, 12 trillion dollars on GDP globally. But when we look at the more parochial world of, let's say, the utility sector in North America, that translates to something like uh, around the two to three hundred billion dollar spend over the last two to three years um, that was planned and expected in terms of capex to just maintain the utilities, uh, aging infrastructure, and, and replacement costs. Um, you know, utilities on the other hand also continue to uh, feature in terms of market uh, margin pressure. So we've seen a lot of um, margin pressure occurring in many, many uh, resources type industries. Uh, the 35% reduction there in, indicated on the slide is really referring to the oil and gas sector due to oversupply and the, and the, and the you know, decline in, in oil prices and the impact that is having on, on creating stranded assets in that sector. Um, you know, even regulated industries like utilities continue to face pressures of a similar nature where regulators are expecting lower returns on their rate basis. So these are these are economic pressures bearing down in terms of both market conditions, regulatory pressures as well. And one of the other interesting uh, context points to bear in mind when we get into um, resources type industries is, is a generational shift. Um, some of us of a certain age might find iPhones difficult to deal with, but actually there's a generational shift of a more fundamental nature uh, to do with skills and capability. And a lot of the engineering skills, a lot of the really deep, insightful stuff garnered over decades, in some cases, of individuals in certain industries are retiring. And we've we've seen this uh, workforce issue played out many, many times. And the graying of the workforce is not a new topic. But that topic is, is, is brought into sharp contrast uh, when technology is moving so quickly at the same time. And... Um, you know, 40%, I think, was the number used in, in, a, in a certain utility that we're familiar with, where that, that 40% of its workforce in a certain utility in North America is eligible for retirement in the next five years. So that level of shift of skill out um, has a significant impact on operational capabilities, on, on in the integrity of the of operations fundamentally. And then finally, um, what Waleed well, just ended his uh, introductory remarks on uh, on outcomes uh, as, a, as a key driver of thinking about our business issues and, and then thinking about the technology to enable those outcomes. I think consumers are increasingly uh, moving towards, um, uh, you know, expectations are rising towards uh, delivering outcomes. You know, no longer is it just sufficient to receive your kilowatt hour uh, on a regular, uninterrupted basis into your home. But, you know, added services are wanted. You know, there is a greater demand from consumers to um, have sticky services, if I can call it that. And for utilities, uh, if I stick on utilities again, to provide those services uh, to maintain those, retain those customers, avoid the churn and actually, in some cases, increase the share of wallet. But to deliver those outcomes, um, 
you know, customers expect greater levels of reliability at no additional cost, typically. It's almost become a threshold requirement that you want more without having to necessarily pay more. Again, exacerbating the economics of your business. So with that context and with, with the parallel track of technology changes in the, in the, in the sort of IoT domain, you know, we, we looked at, uh, we look back uh, in preparation for this discussion around what are the things that are really uh, that we've been doing with our with our clients. And so the next slide is really showing um, a little bit of the pressure that that also you know apart from the points I just raised um, in asset intensive industries we're seeing aging assets right not just aging people um, and increasing need for interoperability. And what I mean by that is uh, more dependencies between between operations. And, and, and the complexity also therefore increasing. We're also seeing more a growth in uh, control systems. And one of the, one of the, one of the uh, side effects of, of, of technology becoming easier to deploy, um, for example, I read somewhere statistics that the cost of sensors is dramatically declining almost at faster than Moore's law would suggest, you know, processor power is increasing CPUs. Um, at that rate of decline in sensor costs, we're seeing proliferation of data we're seeing actually as a result more silos and data integration issues therefore becoming prevalent. And indeed, to close that gap requires a significant rethink as well from a technology platform standpoint. And, and the need to close the gap between control systems and planning systems and, uh, is, is also uh, you know, an issue. So the separation of OT from IT becomes greater than, than, than ever before because each each domain is building its own world or its own silo. Um, and I've already mentioned the pressure to reduce costs and OPEX and margin and so forth uh, on the previous slide. Um, and, and given this context around asset intensive industries, um, it's important that when we look at this, we, we, we think about what is it that is really required as an outcome, not just for customers of, of, of our industries, but also you know, uh, customers as in the clients that we serve as, as service providers, providers or as software vendors um, that typically, you know, uh, help help these industries. Um, and so moving on, I'm going to dive into a couple of examples of, of what we think is the emerging areas of, of IIoT. And at the more prosaic level, you know, the more simple level, it's not, not it's about bringing for example, in this case, the OT and IT world together a little bit more closely, the integration of the two to address the data uh, platform and the consistency of data across the enterprise. So there's a single view to, to provide that kind of situational awareness across your assets, your operations, your customers, indeed the whole enterprise. And uh, taking one example of that around asset management, um, we, we worked in the utility space to do that with several different technology vendors. Um, and, and, you know, this, this cycle, I think some people on the call will be familiar with in most asset intensive industries is, is, is about asset management. It starts with, you know, establishing credible goals around, uh, around what your asset management strategy should be, uh, and, and moves into really, you know, making the investment allocation decisions, uh, as a result. And, you know, utilities understand this process very well. They've been running it for, for decades. Um, investing in those, uh, you know, understanding the risk posed by the asset, uh, trying to trying to use heuristics in some way to make those decisions around the risks and the trade-offs, and make those investments replace or maintain assets as a result, and then really trying to figure out what to do next in terms of improving reliability uh, over the lifetime of, the, of, the, of a particular group of assets or an individual asset um, by looking at the asset condition. So this is a well-trodden path of an asset management process. Uh, there's nothing new here, but what what this brings out in stark contrast with with the problem I pasted on the earlier slide, which was around many data silos coming together, there is a very difficult challenge ahead for for utilities to really make use of uh, information from the OT side of the house, put it together with the planning and ERP information, and really make sense of where the investment decisions should be going on on, on a regular basis, and actually optimize that. And, and, and think back to the regulatory pressures that, that utilities typically face. Uh, and indeed, yesterday I got off a call with a certain utility in Asia where the regulator has, has uh, made a decision, a determination to, reduce, to, to get that utility reduced CapEx by almost a third and OPEX by almost 10%, which poses a phenomenal challenge in the context of the utility. Uh, and, and, and indeed, 
with distributed generation growing, uh, people with more solar panels on their roofs or, 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 or you know, renewable sources of energy uh, impacting grid stability, these challenges become very real for utilities about where to invest, how to maintain you know, um, integrity of their assets. And so the investment management, investment and asset management processes come, come to the fore. And without that consolidated data platform, without the ability to bring together numerous disparate OT systems, you know, up to 20 or 30 are very common with different types of sensors, some without sensors. So, you know, this is not just IoT, it's just about knowing what's going on in the uh, OT space. Um, the, the problem becomes even more complex. So to enable a sort of true fact-based asset management view of your enterprise is a very difficult thing to do. And indeed, armies of people spend you know, um, decades of, of time every year to just figure out what, what their strategy should be. And so I think the outcome here, if I can use Walid's phrase, the outcome approach to asset management is to really understand how best to, you know, reduce your capex, uh, make it, you know, increase your capital efficiency where feasible, uh, or indeed in, in utilities case, which are highly regulated, it's actually the converse is to reduce your opex as much as possible. But uh, whichever the dynamic you need to drive towards, whichever the driver is required, you need that integrated view. And we've, set, we, we've done that work more, most recently, um, which I'll just walk into in the next slide, with a utility where actually in this case with SAP, we have a, we have a global program with them to look at co-innovation with, with industry leaders in the utility sector where we are co-innovating uh, with SAP, Accenture, and, and clients to create that kind of platform and single source of truth to, to deliver an enterprise-wide analytics capability, you know, drawing in data from the sensors in the field, from the different asset classes, um, providing the analytics, predictive analytics capability uh, in order to improve operations, as it says on the slide, you know, reduce the O&M spend, which is fundamental to a regulated utility, and obviously optimize CapEx. Um, and our initial focus is on the on the on the transmission and distribution networks. And what the little cartoon shows on the screen is is, is how whether there are sensors or not uh, on your assets, this is a fundamental first step to get to a world where you can actually really do a, a proper IoT or IIoT activity. And and that situational awareness of of what's happening to your assets is the very first step before you can really think about uh, delivering um, sustainable outcomes to the customers. And this program is, is, is just kicked off in the last 12 months, but certainly we, we're seeing huge traction uh, uh, from a value, business value standpoint around this. Just knowing the state of your assets for utility is, is, is value in itself. Um, as many of you appreciate, you know, these assets have been in the field, in the ground for, for uh, many decades in some cases, and, and, and uh, the state of those assets is not always known to that level of accuracy. Um, Another example, if I can go into briefly uh, and conscious of time, so I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll be reasonably quick. Is is a, is a for a water utility, one of the largest in the world, where um, you know we partner with another software vendor to look at look at how they could get greater situational awareness in a similar context to the to the previous example on on the utility electric and gas utility. This this one in a water utility use a different, more open source software stack. They they were very much again doing the same thing, which is to understand. Where, where are the main water production zones? Uh, what are the ways in which leakage can be minimized? And, and how can the water networks be better monitored? Uh, water and waste networks and, and, and the waste, waste treatment uh, plants as well. And, um, and this was different in some ways because this, this leveraged cloud solutions, cloud-based services to provide, provide the integration that was needed in the cloud uh, between the different data sources. And, um, and, the, and they were able to do things like, you know, understand really pump availability, uh, really understanding where their assets were down to, to provide a more seamless and, and less interrupted service to their clients. Uh, again, regulatory requirements for some of this, but also just good business sense from a capital and uh, operating cost uh, optimization standpoint. Um, and what this does for that utility, for the water utility, is, is, is it, it, it reinforces their license to operate. So the key outcome here is you know, retain your license to operate and ensure that you meet your regulatory requirements. Um, thematically, therefore, I think utilities have a very, very, you know, complex set of stakeholders to serve, not just customers buying their products, but also and services, but also the regulator. 
Um, another example, a more commercial example, is in the is in the mining sector where um, we we enabled um, and worked with a, 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 a fairly global mining concern to look at uh, contractor tracking. I mean, in a simple RFID type uh, mechanisms to really know a couple of things. You know, do we actually know how many contract uh, workforce uh, are on the on the on the site? Do we know what they're doing? Um, do we know whether they're actually working the, the the plan that is set out? You know, are they on time on tools? You know, um, are they too tired? Are they qualified? Uh, and so on. And you know, are they safe uh, fundamentally in operations? Um, and there are a number of outcomes that the client was looking for here, which is obviously around safety, around utilization, around knowing what their what their spend is as well in terms of and, their, and the effectiveness of their of their, of their contingent workforce strategies, and um, and this kind of wireless approach to capturing data from from people, uh, and and the work they're doing, the assets they're doing it, it was reasonably novel and, and not particularly complicated, but it's a huge value driver. For that business, and one of the one of the key things that they got out of it wasn't so much just tracking of their contractors, but also really understanding whether the, whether the work that they were they were scheduling was making sense given the skills and workforce that they needed. So they could determine how to uh, better manage future shutdowns. And, and those who are familiar with mining type industries you know that shutdowns should uh, you know are, are a loss of revenue, and so minimizing turnaround and shutdown is, is fundamental to to maintaining capital efficiency. Um, and another mining example where, where we've seen some of this sort of play out is is where we've um, looked at you know a, 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 a sort of technology led 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 discussion where it was less of a business led discussion where we were trying to operationalize many of the uh, on premise solutions from various vendors which are currently operating at a mine. So you know each 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 uh, each of these solutions were from different vendors. So the challenge the client faced in this case was high cost of IT. Um, disparate systems and integrating that on a simple platform and bringing to that that together um, and providing the real time data from those disparate systems was fundamental to it. So you'll see that this is not um, you know iPhones and iPads and sensors doing clever stuff. This is actually very simple things about bringing data together again and providing the right insight to management and operations uh, to be able to make the right decisions um, at the front line. And what's important here in this example is the decision processes were further to the field than, than further away from the field. So they were closer to the field in the hands of the supervisors to really see that in an integrated way as opposed to worrying about which disparate source of uh, information uh, they should look at, which typically didn't come together for days and days after the event and probably not at the field, but at the management level. So this really kind of, A, integrated the information, B, put the information at the tips of that per people in the field, in operations, who are really dealing with the day-to-day -day hazards on the mine. Um, and uh, before I go to the next slide, um, I really want to bring this together as a sort of very much a resources-focused discussion so far. And, and we haven't gone into the consumer side of the business, uh, given, given the length of the you know, time slot we have. But whichever way you go, one of the things that we've learned about the uh, barriers to value, if you like, you know, we've talked about being outcome focused and, and you know, really focused on, on the verticals uh, uh, that we talked about earlier. One of the biggest issues about realizing that value is that nobody owns the whole IoT stack, if you like. And on the left of this chart, we show a typical you know, Accenture point of view around what is in the IoT stack from everything from human interaction at the top whether it's from mobile wearable technology, uh, whether it's from visualization on portals or whatever it might be, or, or even you know, AR gesture recognition type, type stuff, um, all the way down to the bottom where intelligent devices come into play. And we haven't even gone into the discussion on intelligent devices, but the point is that this stack is disparate. There are many, many vendors associated with providing any, any capability in any of those uh, um, layers of the stack. And indeed, there are many best of breed solutions too, um, but none cut across the top to bottom. And you need to bring together each of these components from device to network connectivity to data management, and some of the examples alluded to that, the analytics, which is fundamental to make sense of all of the data that's coming in from, from uh, OT systems, 
the integration to the platforms that, that might hold this information in real time or, a, or a, you know, an offline storage, whatever it might be, and the applications ultimately that, that impact the workflows and the people at the top. No one vendor does this well, and, and I suspect no one vendor will, but the integration and bringing together of these vendors is fundamental to, to, to realizing the value because ultimately I think being outcome focused is one thing, that's setting your, your path forward, but actually knowing which pieces to plug together and, and not have too many vendors in the space is, is fundamental. And, and the integration of that and the delivery of that on a consistent basis is what's going to differentiate those who've managed to do that well and those who still struggle with point solutions in any of the stack there, right? So somebody's dealing with human interaction, somebody's dealing with intelligent devices, but, but nobody's dealing with the whole. So uh, as a sort of last point on this is, is the technology piece is interesting but it's very complex and a mess. And I think getting clear on that is, is fundamental to driving value. Um, I'm gonna pause there um, and hand over now to Walid to just sort of summarize, I guess, um, you know, our, our reflections and lessons from what we've done with our clients. Thanks, Neil. So wanted to wrap up with some takeaways I, the, the one that I think we will probably all agree on right away is the idea of capitalizing on the value of data. So it's number three, right? Uh, right. It's the power of IT comes from not just you know generating data from objects, but also sharing it between players, you know, and within the organization. But the idea of following the data right? that, that there is something very powerful about the analytics component. Once you have sensor data, I pull it out and start to look and see where are the inefficiencies in, in the process, right? whether it's maintenance or operations or diagnostics, that can do root cause analysis on where and why a fault occurred in your rotating equipment, for example, whatever the, the asset uh, is. So the idea of capitalizing on the value base is really, really important. When you think about really where the power of, of, the, of any technology is in looking at the entire process, right? So taking that data in the context of, right, uh, the supply chain, the manufacturing um, execution process, and, and, and making sure that you take a look at the workforce uh, that are participating in the process and, and make sure that they are part of the solution. Right? So it's not just the insight, but the actual business process that you're trying to optimize. Um, so that, yeah, I think... You know, once you start with number three, incidentally, I guess it's in the middle here. There's two on the right and two on the left. I think the other four really are an important part of the um, the win, right? And so from left to right, reimagining your business, reimagining, you know, where you fit in, this, in the ecosystem, creating this idea of a product-service hybrid, right? whether it's an attractive product that you want to sell, or taking advantage of an asset that you own and making sure that it's wrapped with a digital service so you can take advantage of, again, things like remote monitoring. But looking at your uh, your business and your industry model is an important part of uh, winning. Every product is, is going to be connected and it's going to enable a new service. And so that's, that's, that's sort of a fact. And so from there, you have to search for what that means to you. Creating a chain reaction across industries, this is really about uh, this is fundamentally a digital trend. Certainly there are physical, right, this is a physical uh, digital blur that's happening, but, but, but the idea that uh, digital technologies are breaking down industry barriers is undeniable, whether it's Uber, whether it's, uh, you know, PayPal or you know, in the hospitality sector, Airbnb, right? every industry you look at, digital is sort of the Trojan horse into another industry. And so it's a competitive advantage if you can leverage that channel. And to do that successfully, you have to look at ecosystems, right? It's not just technology vendor ecosystems, but also business partners that you want to work with. Again, it's, it really depends on your industry. And then on the right-hand side of, the, of number three, preparing for the future of work, really believe in this passionately at Accenture Radio. That, you know, we believe that the increasing use of smart products and robotics will certainly change the required skill set on the job. It will certainly mean automation, and automation always translates into some sort of job reduction at that particular process that you're trying to optimize. 
but it then opens up new opportunities in other areas. Right? Employees can actually be doing different things with these intelligent machines. Again, the time frame on that is debatable, but it's, it's certainly preparing for the future of work is something that you have to think about. And drones are one of the popular examples that uh, were discussed last year and the year before uh, as having a contribution to uh, efficiencies in, in, in assets that are sort of in far-fetched locations. But who's going to, you know, who's going to interpret the data that's being brought back? Right? It's not just going to be machine learning. There's going to be some action that has to be taken. And so there's going to be new roles and responsibilities with robotics. Uh, and then I think number five is just the idea of, of, of strategy being an important part of that. You know, uh, removing the fuzziness around what the value proposition is, uh, putting a roadmap together, understanding the enabling technologies, and then translating that into an operational plan. So, so those are you know, a number of ways to win. We can come up with a couple more. Thanks for your attention. This comes to the end of our presentation. Thanks, Anil and Walid. I just remind attendees, um, if you have any questions, feel free to post them in the, in the chat area, as well as um, one thing I would ask of you, um, Kale is going to put up a couple of poll questions. i um, be very interested in hearing from you in terms of what was your one key learning um, from today's webcast. Uh, that'll be the first question. Um, and the second question is, what future topics are you interested in? So would appreciate it if you could respond to those questions and um, as well as pose any of the questions you have the chat. And I'll start right now with a couple of questions. Uh, first question, um, what industries are leading the way in uh, this industrial Internet of Things? So real quick, uh, this will lead, you know, any asset intensive industry for sure. Asset owners and operators, so uh, utilities, um, chemicals, natural resources, you know, those resources industries absolutely are, are very keen on um, you know, extending the life of their assets, getting more out of their assets. Manufacturing sector, absolutely looking at sensors on the shop floor. It's an important part of the value proposition of these technologies is uh, industry 4.0, right, this idea of moving from um, physical systems to cyber physical systems on the shop floor and wearables uh, are part of that discussion. So if you make something. And then I think anybody who wants to make a, a, an attractive product, whether they contract out manufacturers or not, has to look at value-added services. We always look at IoT as not just the sensors on the shop floor or on the asset, but you know, if, you, if you want to make a product and, and sell it, you've got to think about it. The digital services. But one industry at the forefront of the evolution of outcome-based services is agriculture. I think this is a phenomenal example of connecting geolocation of data and really treating the tree or the, the plant as an individual using sensors, nurturing that, uh, uh, that, that crop and getting the most out of seeding and fertilization. Right? Uh, IoT and, and sensor technologies is an important part of how that, that industry is being transformed. Right, so automated tillers can inject nitrogen fertilizer at a precise depth in terms of fascinating what's happening in that industry. But those are the, you know, those are a couple that are at the forefront. Thanks. So, I mean, I think agriculture is a great example, as you pointed out. And what I find inter interesting, it's an industry that you know people most often think is sort of lagging, but it's actually been quite progressive in this area. Um, second question: What are the barriers to businesses realizing the potential of IIoT? So this is, yeah, this is this this one has yeah. There's a lot of a lot of talking a lot of talking points around this at this topic. Certainly from the technology perspective, it's a diverse city in the industrial systems that are now being connected. There's uh, various uh, um, vintages of products. Some have sensors, uh, others do not have sensors. Right? So you know, I think from the technical side, we can talk about the lack of harmonization simply across IT and OT landscape. Right? How do you seamlessly tie these diverse vendor products? With various, you know, vintages, you know, some of them have poor asset data quality. You know, there's a sunk investment in legacy, in, in, in sort of in legacy, you know, in investments. So how do you up, how do you retrofit that? So, so again, I would say that the the quality of the data and the idea of IT OT sort of colliding certainly a big topic that uh, that we come across in terms of not necessarily a barrier, but something you have to think through. The, I think the other two are sort of on the business side, this, this ecosystem discussion, right, moving from alliances to ecosystem, how you work nicely with multiple parties to get something done for your client. Agriculture is a perfect example. 
where you know the the equipment manufacturer should work with the seeding company, should work with the uh, satellite, the the, the geo mapping data vendor, and bring together a solution for the customer. Right. So thinking in terms of outcomes, whether you're going to sell on outcomes or not, is a different story. It's certainly part of this idea of ecosystems. And then so I think solving for operationalizing IoT is important as well. We always talk about technologies. At the end of the day, there's going to be a people and process change management component, and it's going to be necessary. You know, what do wearables imply in terms of uh, the day-to-day of, of a worker? Right. So you have to take a hard look at change management and sort of tr- troubleshoot the process uh, that's now receiving new inputs, uh, and, and you know, you're using prediction now to get ahead of a problem. So I think you know, we've we got to certainly look at business process changes. Great. You know, what, uh, what, 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 Walid, uh, sorry, uh, Walid, I would just add one thing, sorry, Paul, to that, which is that some, in some instances, it's very difficult to have a clear vision of what it should be. So thinking about outcome was one of the points you made earlier. But one thing we have seen with some clients who struggle with this is, is, is internal alignment around disparate pieces of the organization. Because the IoT agenda is not owned by IT, it's not owned by operations. Um, it's actually a combination of a number of disparate parts of a typical business, and bringing that together into a single vision is is one of the barriers actually that's fundamental. So we've seen that successfully in some clients come together, but it's very difficult to find the right stakeholders and the right agenda that binds the organisation to go after this because it does require a bold vision, a joined up vision between between technology and operations. So just one closing question. I'll just go back briefly to your five points. I, I mean, the first one was in around, you know, sort of reimagining business models. Um, what do you find works best in, in dealing with clients and really getting them to, you know, step out and, and you know, think of um, things in a totally new way? Uh, I, so a couple of things. The first thing is to look at other industries and what they're doing. So getting inspired by the agriculture example, or getting inspired by Michelin, or getting inspired by Tesla, right? So really taking a close look at what others are doing across industries is is a very helpful uh, first start. Uh, I, I think another is, which is related to that, is uh, is really understanding. You know, we talk about ecosystem a lot, <laughs> but you really have to sort of double click on that and say, you know, what does an ecosystem of partners mean really to me? Right? How will I incorporate third party data to enhance my own service if that's, you know, part of the discussion around reimagining industry models? So I think really uh, unpacking the word ecosystem is, is another one. I've had a number of cases where clients sort of put me in the corner and say, well, what do you, what's the, you know, what, what does my ecosystem look like? Great. And I think your, your, one of your last points I thought was great, number five, was, was basically in terms of like pilots, you know, start small, sort of just do it, prove it, grow it sort of thing. Um, any, any other further commentary on that uh, in, in closing? No, I, I, you know, I'm just, I mean, I come from an R&D world. So the, the, the experiment, fail fast um, mentality is sort of ingrained in me. I know that that is what we promote. Uh, at Accenture with clients exploring new technologies all the time. What's the first POC that you can um, prove the value of this technology? So getting a stakeholder excited, you know, right? Uh, the VP of manufacturing, yep. for example, around sensor technology, right? Bring them in to a workshop somewhere. Uh, get that individual excited. Get that group excited. Make sure that they're a cross-section from OT and IT because they'll be working together uh, across the systems, right? The business systems and the you know, the the, uh, uh, the manufacturing of the production system. So get them all in a room and get them excited about the value of IoT. I think that that's sort of a, a great first step in terms of tr- triggering a POC. And I think as well, the uh, the other thing as well, once they sort of see this stuff, it's interesting, the other possibilities that they start to imagine. So on that yeah, note... Yeah, the possibilities and some, and some of the risks as well. Yeah, some of the risks around cybersecurity issues. Right, well, what if... Right, if everything is connected, um, you know, from my production systems, what if, right? What asking the question is, what if I'm compromised? How how do I ensure that I put in the right safeguards uh, to prevent a breach? So some of the issues do come up around worker safety as well, and those are healthy to have right up front. Great. 
So thank you very much, uh, Anil and, and Walid, for, for participating in, in today's call. Um, it was very informative and um, look forward to um, continuing our interaction with you folks around this topic. Over to you, Kayla. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, and thank you again to our speakers today for sharing this information with us. As mentioned previously, today's webcast is Episode 6 of 8 in our ongoing series. Information on the upcoming events, links to register, and how to access past recordings will be emailed out to you along with the recording of today's session later on this afternoon. Thank you very much again for your time, and we do look forward to the next time. Thank you.